My name is Stephen Deaton, and welcome to the Law of the Lord podcast, a production of the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. The aim of this podcast is to study God's Word for a deeper understanding and to see how it applies in our lives. Thank you for listening. We encourage you to search the Bible to see whether or not we are speaking the truth because the Bible is the truth. It is the law of the Lord. In this episode, we delve into the idea of restoring the New Testament church. This pursuit was necessary because of the innovations and corruption that saturated, quote, Christianity for centuries. Men departed from the original pattern of truth given by the Lord for the disciples of Christ not long after the apostles died. Through the years, the number of people who drifted and the error greatly increased. Though various efforts were made to change these things, including during the Reformation movement, men often fell short. Then, in the 1700s and 1800s, there were those who took a radically different approach, an approach to go back to what was originally revealed. We will discuss some important principles and foundational truths that support the restoration of the New Testament church. But before we get to that, please hit the subscribe button to be notified of new episodes. Now let's study the law of the Lord together. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. It gives us that concept, that idea that there are people who have gone before us who have learned lessons, and their lives can serve as an example to us. They can either serve as a warning or they can serve as an encouragement, a path to follow. There are negative examples in the Bible, examples like Abraham when he told lies about his wife Sarah, or David when he committed adultery and was responsible for the death of that woman's husband Uriah. Or Jeroboam, the first king over the northern kingdom of Israel who introduced a false religion and set the nation on a path to idolatry for its entire existence. All of those serve as negative examples in the Bible that we need to avoid, we ought to stay away from. It ought to caution us in our life, in our actions. Then there are those who we could look at in more recent times. For instance, Roman Catholicism and how it has completely perverted the religion of Jesus Christ, or the Reformers who protested against Roman Catholicism, men like Luther, Calvin, and Wesley, that made efforts to get away from that institution, but yet fell short. They ended up creating their own man-made religions. And then there are positive examples that we can look at as well positive examples in the Bible like Abraham's faith, because he did have great faith, and he goes down in history as one of the greatest men to have ever lived and one who truly served God. Then there's David, who in spite of his failings, he was a man after God's own heart. He truly did love the Lord and learn from his failures, from his sins, and in the end is counted as a great man. So, you think about those positive examples, positive examples in the Bible. We could look at positive examples of those who have lived before us. Maybe we have known them who have gone before us or those we have not known, including, again, those who were involved in the Reformation movement and those who, in more recent times, sought to go back to the original intent of what is written in the Word of God. And these are the men that we want to focus on now for just a moment or two and and think about some of those who looked at the Word of God, looked at the state of religion in their time, certain beliefs and practices, and realized that the two didn't match up. And so they made great efforts and did a lot of deep thinking and a lot of teaching about getting back to what we read in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Some of the prominent men who sought for the restoration of the New Testament church include a man by the name of Barton W. Stone. 
Now, Barton Stone did the majority of his work in the early, even into the mid-1800s. He did the major portion of his work in the state of Kentucky or the Commonwealth of Kentucky. He had very early doubts about the Presbyterian Creed. He had reservations about the Westminster Confession of Faith. And so it that plagued him because of what he saw compared to what was written in the Word of God. He became involved in what was known as the Cane Ridge Revival, which was a anti-Calvinist revival. It went against the predominant concept in Presbyterian of the day that God had foreordained and willed men to live very specific lives and decided who would go to heaven, who would go to hell. And he was questioning all of that in light of Scripture. And in that Cambridge revival, there were a lot of emotional displays. We we might liken it today to like a Pentecostal or charismatic type revival. And that happened around 1801. In 1803, Stone decided to break away from the Presbyterian Synod of Kentucky, and he formed what was named the Springfield Presbytery. But that was dissolved within a year, so it only lasted 1803 into 1804 because he realized there was something wrong with it here. In fact, I'm going to read from a book called Attitudes and Consequences in the Restoration Movement. I'm going to read a portion or an excerpt or two of the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. I think you'll find this interesting. So they say in the first place, or in Primus, we will, that is, we've decided we have the intent that this body die and be dissolved and sink into union with the body of Christ at large. For there is but one body and one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of our calling. They also say, we will that our power of making laws for the church, government, and executing them by delegated authority forever cease, that the people may have free course to the Bible and adopt the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We will that candidates for the gospel ministry henceforth study the Holy Scriptures with fervent prayer and obtain license from God to preach the simple gospel. We will that people henceforth take the Bible as the only sure guide to heaven. Now let's break those down just very briefly. That first one where they will that this body die and be dissolved and sink into the union of the body of Christ, what they're saying is, that this distinct denomination or division within what they saw as the body of Christ is wrong. To set ourselves apart, to have our own creed, to have our own practices, to have our own fellowship, if you will, that distinguishes us from everybody else is wrong. And we can't do that. We can't make our own law that forms our own religious group. So, we decide that we're getting rid of this, we're walking away from that. They then talked about how they wanted to do away with their power or their idea of making laws for church government. In other words, we can't make up man-made laws. We can't decide what we want and make that a law in the body of Christ. So let's just go to the Bible. Let's go to the Word of God. Those who are ministers, they don't have to go through a um, seminary school. They don't have to adhere to a denominational creed and be ordained or licensed by a denominational body. Rather, just go to the Word of God, study the Word of God, and teach that Word of God. That's what makes someone a minister or a preacher in the eyes of God. And then, of course, the idea that men should turn to the Bible alone as their guide of faith and practice that would lead them to salvation and a home in heaven. So, Barton Stone, you know, in 1804 was making those conclusions, reaching those conclusions, and making those declarations 
about his understanding of going back to the New Testament, restoring what we see in the Word of God. Well, later, there's a man by the name of Thomas Campbell. He was a Presbyterian minister. He was from over in Scotland. He moved to the United States in 1807. He attempted unity among Presbyterians, but he was disciplined uh, by the Presbyterian church, and he ended up producing what was called the Declaration and Address. And in that Declaration and Address, one of the things he stated, and he coined the phrase, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. So, there's another way of putting that over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. This is the way the Word of God states that. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, let's go to God's Word for our understanding, our convictions, our beliefs, our teachings, our practices. So, if you speak, speak as the oracles of God. We speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible is silent. So, we need a thus saith the Lord. We need Bible authority for all that we do. That was Thomas Campbell's conviction and conclusion. Well, his son, Alexander Campbell, moved to the United States in 1809, and he joined up with his father, and they had had little correspondence about these things, but when they got together and began talking, they realized the two of them independently had been reaching similar conclusions. They realized in 1812 that infant baptism was unscriptural, and they studied the Word of God and realized, oh, baptism is by immersion. And at that time, they went from being associated with Presbyterians to being associated with the Baptist church. And so they were immersed and joined in with the Baptists. But that didn't last very long. In 1816, Alexander Campbell preached what was titled Sermon on the Law, and that blew things up big time. And we'll talk more about it later, but basically what he laid forth was the Old Testament is the Old Testament, and it's obsolete, and the New Testament is our only rule of faith in practice. And that blew people's minds at the time, and it still blows people's minds today. But he was a very prolific debater. He was a very prolific writer. He had a couple of different magazines during his lifetime and proclaiming these fundamental principles. And he, in his debates, very often uh, persuaded people because he had such a very, um, I guess you would say, clear logic, irrefutable arguments on what he had studied and understood to be the truth and reasoning from Scripture on those things, not just something he had made up himself. Well, in addition to the Campbells, there was another man by the name of Walter Scott, and uh, they were friends. He was friends of the Campbells. He was also a Presbyterian minister initially. He concluded around 1821, 1822, that baptism was for the remission of sins, and he did most of his work on what was called the Western Reserve, which is modern-day Ohio and Indiana. Just think about the country back in the 1820s, that the western part of the country was considered, if you will, uh, the Western Reserve. But uh, he had great success in going around teaching the Word of God, teaching the basic plan of salvation, including baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And there was so much success. There were so many people that were agreeing with and accepting that truth from God's Word that Alexander Campbell doubted what had happened until he or his father visited and saw how many people were responsive to that teaching. So, there was a great time of what we might say revival, a great time of conversion of people out of denominational man-made error in accepting 
to simple, plain Bible truth. But all that, again, going on in the early to mid-1800s and continuing its effects after that. But here's some of the things I want us to consider that men began to understand some basic truths. One of those, as we've stated in one way or another already, but just to clarify it, there should be no creed but Christ. You know, various churches, various religious or, religious organizations had creeds that established and defined what made them who they are and established and defined their fellowship. But when you look into the Word of God, it's not delegated to men to make up their own rules of faith and practice, but the Bible is very clear that God speaks through his Son in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, for instance. Paul, a bond serve, or I'm sorry, uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So, God speaks through his Son. So, if we're going to hear God, we're going to hear his Son. Now, his Son authorized men to go out and to teach in his name. For instance, John 16, verse 13, where he told the apostles the Spirit would come and guide them into all truth. He would reveal to the apostles the things that the Father had revealed to the Son. And so, the Father speaks through his Son in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And that the this revelation that has been given is an all-sufficient revelation. There's nothing missing. There's nothing that is outside the Word of God that we need to clarify, that we need to guide us, that we need to accept in order to be pleasing in God's sight. You know, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, we have everything we need revealed in the New Testament. We don't need to go outside of it seeking things. We don't need to go to a council of men or some great teacher to learn something that's not in the Word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. The Scripture is sufficient for all things. So that's a fundamental truth that they came to understand and that we can see in the Word of God that we need to accept if we're going to be pleasing in the sight of God. They also understood, and the Bible teaches, that there's a distinction between the Old and New Testaments. In Luke chapter 16, Verse 16, this is one of those things that a lot of people today don't understand. They want to go back to the Old Testament and grab some things out of the Old Testament and then mix it up with things in the New Testament to create a system of religion, a, a belief, a practice, worship practices. They want to mix the two together. But notice what Jesus said in Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. So, the law and the prophets were until John. And then there's a change that begins to occur there, where, remember, he was the forerunner of Christ who would give his life. And when he gave his life on the cross, he established a New Testament, a new will and testament. So, remember Hebrews 9 verse 16, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So, Jesus Christ established a new testament with his blood 
when he died. Now, if you look in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 7, the Hebrew writer talks about how that this was God's plan all along to establish a new covenant under his son. So, Hebrews 8, verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now let's break that down a little bit. First of all, note that that is a quote from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. So Jeremiah the prophet, centuries before Jesus came into the world, had revealed this concept, this idea, that there would be a new covenant established with God's people. Now, when he quotes from Isaiah, the Hebrew writer here, rather, quotes from Jeremiah, when he quotes from Jeremiah, the Lord said he would make a new covenant, not according to the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. Well, that covenant, of course, was the law of Moses. So there's a change of the law here, a change of covenants. He said there was that one covenant with Moses at Sinai. There is a new covenant that's going to be established. And in that new covenant, his people would not go and teach each other about the Lord, to know the Lord. And here's the reason for that. Under the old law, anyone born into Israel had to be educated about God, about his law, about his covenant. Now, in the new covenant, in the New Testament, remember that those who are already disciples of Christ go and teach the world who's lost, who's separated from God, who doesn't know about God, who doesn't understand about Jesus Christ. And so you have to now go out and teach people, and then they enter into this covenant. And so once they enter in, they don't need to be taught about the Lord, about Jesus Christ being the Savior and things like that. That's the idea he's laying down there. And he's saying in this new covenant, I will be merciful and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's forgiveness in the new covenant. Our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ in this new covenant. In the old covenant, there was no provision for that. There was only condemnation. And that's why it's referred to by Paul as the covenant of death or the ministry of death. You see, there's a new law. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 7, as he's talking about the change of priesthood from the Old Testament Levitical priesthood to now the priesthood of Christ, he says this, Hebrews 7 verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. See, Christ could not serve as high priest under the old covenant, under the old law, because he was of the tribe of Judah, not of the tribe of Levi. So there's been a change of the law, and that's the idea that we are now under the authority of the New Testament. We can't go to the Old Testament for authority in our religious beliefs and practices, you know, things like having a priesthood, having a clergy. Well, that's Old Testament. That's not New Testament. Things like having instrumental music or burning incense. All of that belongs to the Old Covenant, not to the New and we can't go back there to justify practices and beliefs 
that we would hold today. Uh, we can't go back there and say we must be circumcised, for instance. No, we, we have to go by what is written in the New Testament because we're under a new law. Another fundamental truth, and this is so vital and yet so many people fight it tooth and nail, is that water baptism is by immersion and is for the remission of sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Who does not believe will be condemned. And a lot of people want to latch on to, well, not believing is the condition for condemnation. And they want to use that to say it doesn't say anything about baptism. Well, in the first part it does, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. It's very important to realize the Lord tied those two things together. Peter echoes this in Acts 2, verse 38, when he tells the people on Pentecost, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, water baptism is for the penitent believer one who accepts the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and is willing to turn away from his or her sins. It is a burial in water. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 beginning, it says this, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You see how he says buried with him? Well, what does that mean? That means immersion. It's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. But it is immersion in water in order to have our sins forgiven. That's why in Acts 8, 36 to 38, when Philip is teaching the Ethiopian about Christ and about salvation, that the Ethiopian says, see, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe, you may. He confessed his belief in Jesus as the Christ, and he stopped the chariot, and both went down into the water. And the reason both went down into the water is because Philip immersed him. He didn't scoop up a cup full or use his hand and sprinkle it onto him, but they both went down into it because baptism is a burial it is an immersion, and it is for the remission of sins. In Acts twenty two sixteen, there Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, we know him better as Paul, of course, but told Saul, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So that was a fundamental truth that Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism and Methodism, and Baptist, they missed those things. They might have gotten part of it here and there, but they didn't put all of it together. But you can clearly see in Scripture where all those things come together. Immersion in water for the remission of sins, and it's only for the penitent believer. Something else that they understood and really the overall focus of what we're talking about is the church in the New Testament must be restored. It, it's not enough to reform a church of men. You know, it's not enough to just sort of tinker with one thing here and another thing there, like Martin Luther strove to do with Roman Catholic Church because he was a Roman Catholic uh, himself and a, a monk or a priest, and he said, well, there's things wrong here, and we need to reform the Roman Catholic Church. No, don't need to reform that system that is wholly corrupt. We need to repudiate it and just go back to the New Testament and what it teaches. And this principle, this truth is found in the New Testament. So, for instance, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul tells the saints there and tells us, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, 
and the God of peace will be with you. So you follow Paul as he followed Christ, as he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, he says he was sending Timothy to teach them as he taught the same thing everywhere in every church. So, whatever is in the New Testament is to be the rule of faith and practice among all those who are disciples of Christ, among all the congregations that have formed in order to work and worship together, serving the Lord. And we are not to depart from this at all. This is a great scripture for this. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. So, Galatians 1, verse 6 says this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And what this is saying is truth agrees with truth. Don't depart to another gospel because there really is no other gospel. Everything that's a departure is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. And so it doesn't matter if it's the apostles, it doesn't matter if it's an angel from heaven, it doesn't matter who it is, if they preach something that was not in the original message, reject it. And that's the principle of restoring the New Testament church. We have to go back beyond all the centuries of corruption and departure and corrosion and see what the original truth was as it was revealed by the Lord in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. We have to reject those who bring anything different. As 2 John teaches in verse 9, whoever transgresses does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So, reject it. John said in his first letter, 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. See, there are many people who teach things that are not according to the Word of God, including Luther, Calvin, Wesley, so many others. And we have to repudiate those things. Listen to the apostles and what they have revealed. You know, the Bible repeatedly tells us not to add to or take from it. In fact, the closing of the New Testament revelation and the book of of Revelation states this. This is a principle that applies to the book of Revelation specifically and generally to all of God's Word. Where in Revelation 22, 18, John writes, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. See, we cannot add to or take from the word of God. We are to teach no other doctrine and reject those who do teach a different doctrine. Something else that is fundamental is that unity is achieved by following the truth. So, if you follow the truth and I follow the truth, we will necessarily have a unity together. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, it states this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. See, there's unity in the truth. 
when we accept what the Word of God says, we will both be together. Jesus prayed for this unity. Paul admonished this unity. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We plead for that unity today. This is needed. Divisions among those who say they're believers in Jesus Christ helps to create unbelievers, helps to destroy people's faith in God. And so people need to unite upon the truth. So one example of this. In the Bible, followers of the Lord are called saints, disciples, Christians. They're referred to as brethren. And we can and ought to unite upon that. How do you identify a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, that person's a Christian. What are you? Well, I'm a saint. I'm a disciple. I'm a Christian. Division comes when men introduce designations and names that are not in the Word of God. For instance, Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal or Presbyterian. See, none of those things are in the Word of God. None of those things are authorized by the Word of God. And so when somebody comes along and says, hey, I'm a Methodist. Well, I don't want to be a Methodist. I just want to be a Christian. Well, I'm a Baptist. I'm of the Baptist faith. I'm a member of the Baptist church. Well, that's not in the Bible, and I don't want to be a part of it. And so you see how that creates division? Whereas what's revealed in the Word of God creates unity when we accept it and it alone. And let's realize that unity is possible. Some people don't believe that, but read the Word of God, right? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We can understand the Bible alike. We can have an agreement on those things. In Ephesians 3, verse 3, says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So when we read the writings of the apostles and prophets, Paul says you can understand my knowledge. In other words, we can understand what Paul understood. We can have agreement with him in understanding. We can have unity in understanding. And so if we agree with what Paul says, if I agree with him and you agree with him, you understand what he understood and I understand what he understood, then you and I are going to understand alike. Do you see how unity is possible? Don't let Somebody discourage you. Don't accept that lie that we can't understand the Bible alike. We can. And the Bible declares it to be so. Wouldn't it be cruel? Wouldn't it be terrible if we actually believed in a God who gave us a message that we could not understand alike? That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God I believe in. I believe in a God who is able to reveal his will and preserve that will down through the centuries where you can read it and I can read it, we can understand it, and we can understand it alike and be united in that truth. The things that we have discussed are some basic principles and foundational truths that undergird the restoration of the New Testament church. Going back to the original revelation of the Spirit and setting aside the doctrines of men is the only way we're going to please the Lord. So we submit this for your consideration. Thank you for listening to the Law of the Lord podcast, a work of the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. Find out more about us on our website, lawofthelord.com. We also invite you to watch our videos on what does the Bible say about. You can find videos on what does the Bible say about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, what does the Bible say about death, suicide, baptism, and our most popular video in the series, 
what does the Bible say about the Antichrist? Go to our website at lawofthelord.com slash what. That's lawofthelord.com slash what. We encourage you to reach out to us with any questions or comments about this episode or any Bible question that you may have. We will strive to answer that personally for you, and we may address it on a future episode. We look forward to hearing from you.